Welcome to CU at USC. I'm your Wednesday night host, Mackie Kravitz, and tonight we have one of USC's distinguished professors of composition. Morton Lawrenson is here, and he's going to talk to us about everything music. It's sure to be a pitch-perfect episode, so be sure to stay tuned. Welcome back to see you at USC. Now I'm joined by Morton Lordson, who is a USC professor and composer. Thank you so much for being here. I'm happy to be here. So you have had a long history with music. Um, where did it all begin for you? As a child playing piano and trumpet later on and then uh, going up uh, to study at Whitman College and not taking any music at all my really? first year. And uh, I had the wonderful experience prior from high school before going to Whitman College uh, to fight forest fires for the Forest Service and then went to Whitman for a, one year and studied poetry and history and things like that. I have a lot of interests as well as music, mm -hmm. but no music at all. And then I had the uh, life-changing experience of being on a lookout, a Forest Service lookout for 10 weeks alone uh, right after my freshman year in the wilds of Washington State up by Mount St. Helens <laughs> and uh, totally alone except for when the ranger would show up once a week with supplies mm -hmm. and it was a time for deep um, personal thought and reflection and I determined on that tower that music needed to be a large part of my life and I was not sure in in what direction it would be musically. I didn't, I was a performer, pianist, and trumpet player, but I didn't think I wanted to do that. Mm. So I simply went back to Whitman College and took every music class I could, and then made the decision that if I were to get into music, it would be a very good idea to transfer to a renowned mu school of music. And so many people had suggested USC. <laughs> and I came down here and met and, uh, over a spring break from Whitman College uh -huh. and uh, met with professors and um, met with a very distinguished head of the composition department, Halsey Stevens, mm -hmm. uh, who allowed me conditionally to take a beginning composition class as a junior for one semester conditionally to see how I'd do it. Mm -hmm. And Without having to audition or get into the school? That's just right. Just that you audit the class? That's right. Hmm. Uh, and uh, so I, I sat in, was very, very well taught, and within two years had a composed a trumpet sonata that got published, a choral work that got published, and eventually succeeded that gentleman, Halsey Stevens, as chair of the composition department. Um, so I was very, very well taught by a, a number of people over the years at USC. They wanted me to join the faculty, which I did, and I have, this is my 50th year of teaching classes there. Incredible. And um, so, imagine that. I came down here <laughs> as an undergraduate in 1963, the changes that I've seen at USC in all those years. Oh, I'm sure there's m many, many changes that many you've changes, seen. Yes. And an evolution in the program. Yeah. But I want to go back for a second and talk about before you even did music, what was what changed? Did something happen where you realized that that's what you wanted to pursue? That was your true passion. I missed it. I I was I didn't I was away from music, and I thought that you know music. When I was growing up, music was a very important part of my life. I I played in bands. I played in dance bands. I played jazz. I sang in my church choir, and then to be without it, um, I you know, there's something inside of you. I must say, my parents were not exactly thrilled when I made the <laughs> announcement that <laughs> I, I listen when I when I not. told them that I was going to transfer to the to the University of Southern California mm -hmm. to become a musician. There was no <laughs> clicking of wheels. <laughs> In fact, my mother's parting words as I got into my 1953 Buick to drive south down here <laughs> were, "When it doesn't work out, you can always come home." and eat crow. And I told her at that time, I said, I have two responses to that. 
there is something inside of me that tells me that I need to do this, that I need to explore this. And every music major knows this, or everyone majoring in art or dance mm -hmm. or something like that. You are compelled to do that. He, as Campbell said, and he got it right, follow your own bliss. You have to listen to your inner core. And going into art, artistic endeavors, is a very risky business. Absolutely. And I told my mother at that time, I said, you know, there's something inside of me that says I have to do this. I may fail, most people do when they come down here, uh, but I'm not gonna look back on my life as an old man and say, why wasn't I brave enough to try and give it my best shot? So I'm gonna go down there, and I also said to her, crow ain't on my menu. If it doesn't work out, I'm gonna, go th I'm gonna do something else. I love lots of things. I've got a great interest in poetry, mm -hmm. in history. Um, but I came down here and I trusted the faculty of the renowned USC School of Music to help me sort it out. Mm -hmm. And I, I took a variety of classes and found my niche in composition. Was very well guided, worked very hard, was poor as a church mouse. I lived in a, a place we called Wacky Manor on 25th in Vermont <laughs> uh, with a bunch of, it seemed like half the music school was there. Uh, and, hmm. and uh, just worked very, very hard. The students at that time as well were absolutely amazingly talented. I mean, Michael Tilson Thomas, was, uh, who's now the conductor of the San Francisco Symphony. Mm -hmm. Martin Katz, who's now the dean of, really the dean of, of uh, accompaniment, accompanying. Ralph Grierson, all these extraordinarily gifted colleagues of mine as students. Mm -hmm. And also, I had the great fortune of singing in a church choir, uh, not uh, at the university choir here. Mm. And um, they premiered my initial compositions for choir. And it, uh, I went into to specialize in vocal music because it combined my second love with music, and that is poetry. I read it every day. Most of the classes I've taught over 50 years at USC begin with a poem. It simply takes us up a peg, and we learn so much <coughs> uh, about poetry. And of course, USC is very thrilled these days to have on the faculty the renowned poet Dana Joya, who for seven years chaired the National Endowment for the Arts and is currently the Poet Laureate of California. Yeah. Um, and I might say, and this is a, a kudo for USC, Dana was raised in Hawthorne, which is a fairly low blue collar area by the airport. Mexican mother, Italian father. Um, and he told me that those years when he was growing up, the man is now in his early 60s, when he was growing up as a young man, aside from his family and his church, two things were of supreme importance to him as a young man. One was the public library in Hawthorne, California, mm. where he could go and read books that his parents could not afford to purchase. Mm -hmm. And secondly, was the USC School of Music that welcomed a young poor kid from Hawthorne to come down to free concerts virtually every night of the week. And when Dana retired, when his term ran out at uh, the National Endowment for the Arts, he had multiple job offers in business, uh, in industry, and in all kinds of things, including uh, university, major university positions. He chose USC. <laughs> he wanted to come back. Wonder why. Wonder why. <laughs> and now he's a, a Judge Whitney uh, professor of poetry. USC, I've watched it over 50 years. It has never been better than it is now, and that's due to the leadership of uh, Steve Sample for 20 years, Max Nikias currently. Mm -hmm. uh, brought in brilliant new faculty, new facilities. There's a vibrancy that uh, is thrilling, and to see USC ranked amongst the top universities now anywhere is uh, thrilling to me. I've seen it rise over the years. It's been a joy for me. I can totally see that. I mean, you speak with such passion about this school, and that's something that I know I love to see when I'm talking to professors or faculty of the school. Right. So right. what would be your favorite 
memory at USC, I would have to say. So far. Hopefully there's more to come. I think as a professor, the joy for me has been over the years to see the success of my students, to achieve uh, great fame artistically. Um, one of the things that I'm most proud of at USC was founding the Advanced Studies Program mm -hmm. in Film Scoring. I did that in the, in the mid-80s. I went to the dean at that time and said, what's wrong with this picture? We're 50 feet what, from what is uh, undoubtedly the greatest film school on the planet. <laughs> We're in Hollywood, and many of the students in composition who come here want to do films, and we don't have a program for that. And we should have an advanced program, a master's level program in film scoring. Mm -hmm. So I set it up. It took me two years to do that, and we went out. I went out uh, with others and, and brought in leading film composers, Jerry Goldsmith and David Raxson and Alexander Courage and Elmer Bernstein. Mm -hmm. So many of them. Yeah. Bruce Broughton. Um, and this program is considered to be the finest in the world, and it does my heart very well to see graduates of that program, such as uh, uh, Ilya Simaral uh, and uh, Marco Beltrami and all, get Academy Award nominations and have great careers in, in uh, film scoring. That's a, that is a thrill for me. It, it took quite a bit to put that program together, but uh, it's run now beautifully. and. Uh, well that's worth certainly, it. yeah, it's certainly a highlight for me. Well, you definitely sound like you're an active member of the Trojan Mafia, yep. keeping it all in the family yep. here. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's what we love, right? Right. So, through USC, I mean, you've grown up with it. Right. Do you have any expectations or desires what to see in the future? Well, it's on a tra trajectory that is um, astonishing. Uh, you, you see our faculty getting Nobel Prizes. You see them in the highest academic and honorary societies throughout the land of all types, in mm -hmm. science and the arts and so on. Um, I am one of seven uh, professors at USC who have received the National Medal. And uh, Solomon Gallum, the, the great man in science or technology, we just had a, a, a a very distinguished professor, get one that helped the blind see, you know. Incredible. And, and then uh, Kevin Starr, a great oh man, who, my dear friend who just passed away, the historian laureate of California, National Endowment of the Humanities. It goes on and on. Mm -hmm. uh, George Lucas for technology, <laughs> on and on. And uh, so it's a great feather in USC's cap to have uh, brought faculty like this that are leaders and, and trend makers and inventors of all sorts uh, in the arts and the sciences and technology. Um, I'm very, very proud of what both Steve Sample and Max McKees have done. Yes, I can see that. Yeah. And I'm, it makes me excited to go to a school with such esteemed faculty yeah. and people and have these opportunities to talk and get to know them and stuff like that. There you go. Well, we have to take a quick commercial break, but all when right. we get back, we will learn more about Morton Largston and his what he does at USC, so be sure to stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to See You at USC. Tonight I am joined by Morton Lordson, who is one of the distinguished professors of composition here at USC, which is a very, very auspicious title, I have to say. Good to be here. So at the commercial break, we were talking about music and all of its elements and how right. it affects every sense. Right. And it all starts with composition. So I was wondering, can you take us through your process of how you start to write a piece of music? My main interest and my main catalog and over all these years has been vocal music. And so I start with a text with poetry mm -hmm. and I have at this point eight vocal cycles which are multi-movement works on uh, generally a poetic theme uh, for example and oftentimes by by one poet 
I have a series of works about roses in French by Rainer Maria Rilke. I have a series of pieces called The Midwinter Songs about winter by Robert Graves. I have uh, the, my nocturnes have to do with night on poetry by Neruda, James Agee, and um, Rilke again. Um, I have an, a number of works from the sacred Latin liturgy, a whole series of motets like O Mani Mysterium, the Lux Eterna. I'm very interested in this idea, and, and all of these pieces are very, very different. And I, I read the poetry I, and take, uh, assemble my musical materials to complement and enhance the meaning of the poetry, everything about it, the style, the language, the, the mot motivic themes in it, mm -hmm. Um, the rhythm, the, the harmonies, the, the some are very abstract. Mm -hmm. I have a, a s series of very abstract atonal pieces about on, on edgy poems by Lorca in Spanish about night, and so that's very very abstract. At the same time, I'm my Lux Eterna, which is going to be done once again by the L.A. Master Chorale, that premiered it when I was their composer in residence. It is a serene meditation on illumination on ancient Latin texts for choir and chamber orchestra. Or you can have the pastel colors of my Rilke settings about roses in French. Or the gripping uh, angst-filled madrigali on Renaissance Italian poems about unrequited love. So that's my impetus. And so I will sit down with a poem and I start to assemble my musical material materials in relationship to that poetry. And I have done this throughout my life. And I have a whole body of choral works, of art songs, of instrumental works, um, et cetera. Huh. So just to clarify, these poems are all written in different languages? No. And so do you, are you bilingual? Do you nope. I'm, I'm actually not a very good linguist at all, but I get together with people who are. Ah. I mean, I, I listen. Uh, I want to set Neruda, for example, in the original Spanish, the way that he composed it originally. And so I, you know, I obviously study the text, I self-educate myself in Spanish, but then I get together with experts mm -hmm. to fine tune. Same with the Madrigali in Italian. I haven't studied Italian, I've sung Italian, I've all of that. but. Uh, for example, I got together with a person who was fluent in Italian to read all the text to me, which I then recorded so I could hear the, the, the uh, accents and all this mm -hmm. kind of business. And I, I have to, it's extra innings for me as a composer. It takes longer. Absolutely. But I want to, uh, I'm quite interested in that. I, I feel like I'm in, a, in the sea in an open boat sometimes. Where are these texts going to lead me? So I'm not a linguist, um, but I love to give it a shot. I did study French at one time for my doctoral work, mm. but um, it's been very interesting yeah. for me. Yeah, so what is the timeline? Around how long does it take you to write a full piece of music? Uh, that's impossible to answer. It all depends upon the length of the piece, mm -hmm. the, the uh, for what is written for a choral. Look, I worked for two years on the Lux Eterna. It's a half an hour piece on uh, on illumination and Latin text for chorus and orchestra. I, I'm, a, I'm a slow writer, I'm a painstaking writer. It took me six months to get the O Monium right, and it's only a six minute piece. Um, and although, and I have been asked to score films. I had a wonderful lunch with Raul Perez at Sony Pictures after the success and the Grammy nomination for the Lux Eterna album who liked my music very much and uh, invited me to score a film for Sony Pictures. Mm -hmm. I set up the program for others to score films. I lack an ingredient that uh, is necessary for a film score, and that is to write an awful lot of music very quickly. I don't have that. My music has been used in films. It was used in Angels and Demons. It's been used in a documentary on rebuilding the World Trade Center. So I made it possible for others to do that that can write m music very, very quickly. Um, but I have a great uh, affection for great film music. Mm -hmm. David Raxon, who wrote Laura, and some of those great films, Forever Amber, and <coughs> um, others from that uh, 
Will Penny and, and uh, Al Capone from the 50s and 60s and the 40s as well became a dear friend. And uh, so I admire that and I set up a program at USC for those that would like to do that. And I must say the gifted students that we have from all over, half that class now of 16 is from uh, other countries that have come in. They're, really? They're, they're attracted to come to this program. Wow. And, uh, they're in very, very good hands. If you want to score films, you better take our advanced studies program, our master's program now in film scoring. Clearly, I mean, yeah. apply if you're interested in film scoring. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so just as an artist question, all art is somewhat personal. We all put our own selves into our right. art. How do you put your personal experiences into the pieces you write? I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> uh, I, I do. I, I tell you, <coughs> I must say, I, I do a lot of my composing on a remote island mm -hmm. in the San Juans, and this is where the film about me was made, partly, on the San Juan Islands. San Juan Islands are at the tip of Washington State, looking right across to Canada. Um, some of them are as they were since the beginning of time. Uh, very few people, uh, the place that I have had <coughs> properties on for decades is a remote island. I work in a formerly a general store that was f completely falling apart on the waterfront. I bought it many years ago for 9,000 bucks and spent many years fixing it up into a habitable place. But in that place, I have a $50 piano. It has no electricity, it has no running water. And it was on that $50 piano that I composed the Luxaterna and the Oman Mysterium and some of these pieces that have become famous throughout the world. What a story. But part of that is I'm able to do it on this remote island with about 80 people in pristine silence in a beautiful, gorgeous setting on the water looking west to Canada where all I hear is the lapping of the water, the wind, the birds. <coughs> and I found, as I told you before on the lookout, the importance of having the opportunity to be in a place by yourself in, so you can go down deep in a quiet place. I find that on the island and I have to go down deep. If I'm setting text about perpetual light and illumination and try and get to the essence of what I am, it is important to me that I find a place of serenity. And that's one of my things that I'm very, in all my talks, I talk about trying to find that place. Mm -hmm. And you have to fight for it these days because we are hammered by ambient noise. Uh, as kind of a side note, there ain't no gas powered leaf blowers on the campus of the University of Southern California anymore mm -hmm. because I led a charge to kick them off campus <laughs> starting with the with the president I called him up one day and or I wrote him a, a note this is Steve sample years ago I said Steve I'm teaching an eight o'clock theory class I'm for example teaching my students how to get to the intricacies of a Scarlatti tendential extension and there are two people right outside my window where I'm teaching this class blowing leaves around wearing gas masks and ear protectors so they can't see what they're doing I can barely hear myself talk the university is a place of contemplation. There are other ways to deal with leaves and what somebody's dog had for dinner last night rather than have it blown in our face. Rake them or use, if necessary, the quieter ga uh, electric gas leaf blowers, not, not gas bar, electric leaf blowers. Mm. And so I waged a campaign on that. It took me several months to win that battle, but I did. And now you go there you don't find these things. We are, there's a book out there called In Pursuit of Silence, and it, they call it a, a global catastrophe. We are hammered by ambient noise these days. And so one has to lead the charge to try and get to places that are quiet in silence. It is a, uh, I agree, it's, it is a catastrophe. It is a distraction from oneself. When you have, the monks know this, of course, but when you have quietness, you're able to, to go down deep. You're not hammered by stuff constantly. 
and it can start with a cell phone. I mean, students these days, I feel actually quite sorry for them because there are major meltdowns if they don't have their cell phone within five minutes checking their stuff and texting and all that. And so we must uh, consider that. Get quietness, read poetry, get to your inner self. I love it. I mean, that would go along with my next question, which was going to be, what advice do you have for future students that want to pursue music or arts in general? Yeah. Well, that's one of them. And, and that's, uh, and as I mentioned Joseph Campbell before, follow your own bliss. If you're going to go into that, stay true to yourself. Uh, um, it is a very uh, brave thing to do to go into art. I mentioned my mother all these years ago. Of course, they were being parents, and they were worried about me heading south to do this. I wish she were alive today. Yeah. Well, that's unfortunately all the time we have for tonight. Thank you so much for being here. I learned so much, and I thought this was so interesting. And it's wonderful to have fellow USD professors on this couch with us. Be sure to tune Thank in you. to see you at USC every weeknight at 6.30 here on Trojan Vision. Good night. The Robert Zemeckis Center, home to the award-winning television station Trojan Vision. Here, we foster brilliant students who produce innovative weekly television shows. Our students have won numerous awards in categories like Best Producing, Directing, and Writing. The success of Trojan Vision could not be possible without the creativity, intelligence, and vision of our students. Trojan Vision, award-winning, student-run.